Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the Art and Science of Complex Sales. And we're here with a man that uh, really doesn't need a whole heck of a lot of introduction, but I'll give a small one anyways. Matt Dixon, co-author of The Jolt Effect and co-author of a previous episode of The Challenger Sale and and that series and uh, head of DCM. Matt, welcome to the program, man. Paul, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, no, I, I can't tell you how... And you must get this a lot. I can't tell you how excited I was uh, to have you on the program. Just that just simply... means you need to get out more, Paul. That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that means. <laughs> I, well, okay. I'm happy my to sales... bring some excitement to your life, though. <laughs> my <good>. sales geekiness. <laughs> yes, my sales geek has taken over, and uh, I'm You're a nerd, a nerd's nerd. You. Yeah. Uh, oh my god. It... <laughs> we were chatting about this a little earlier before the podcast. Yeah. yeah. No, I come from a social science background. I absolutely freaking geek out on this stuff. You said regression testing in the book and you had me hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Most people run the other way, but I know I know my audience. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it is awesome. And hey, just for everybody's benefit, one of the things I, I always like to ask, and you have a pretty unique perspective on this. You've done a ton of research. You're coming out from the research angle, but define sales for me. The sales game has a lot of definitions, but what do yeah. you truly look at? So, you know, as saw you you shared that one with me because I, there's, um, and I'm glad you did because I, I spent the past few hours like ruminating about how I was going to give a like pithy and, you know, uh, amazing answer. And I don't think I've come up with it yet. So I was going to ask you to save it for last, but I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab <laughs> at it here, but let me set the bar appropriately low. So I, it's funny, I talked to a, in, in this feeds into what we'll be talking about uh, today, Paul, around the jolt effect, but uh, we've spent a fair bit of time over the past couple of years uh, kind of getting back in, taking the data out on the road with top salespeople and trying to get them to explain to us what we found and and why what we found is the way it is. And one of the, I had a conversation with a top uh, salesperson, a, a guy I actually grew up with at CEB, was one of our top performers, uh, is now a CRO at a company. And I asked him a pretty simple question, much like what is sales? But I said, you know, how'd you become so successful? I don't want to bias you with our research or put words in your mouth, but what makes you a really successful salesperson? And he said something that I thought was disarmingly simple. And it feeds into my answer to your question, which is, he said, I think I've sold a lot in my career by not trying to sell a lot. And, and he said, he knows I'm a golfer. And he says, you know, it's a little bit like when you get up there and you just take a smooth swing and you don't focus so much on killing the ball. It turns out you hit it farther, straighter, better than you ever do. And it's, but it's so hard to do. And it's really hard to do in, in the environment where people are, you know, you're metric to death and people are, you know, pushing you to hit volumetrics and all this stuff. But he said, I've always tried to focus on, and the thing gets, gets me up in the morning is, am I helping this buyer and their company and their team get to a great decision? And sometimes that decision is not to buy from us. And sometimes it's to buy less than maybe I, my manager would like them to buy. But I always try to put their interests front and center and the rest kind of takes care of itself. And it turns out that leads to a lot of loyal customers who trust you, who want to keep coming back. They're, you know, they tell everyone about you and, uh, and you hit your numbers and exceed your numbers. And I think that's been a pretty simple recipe for success. It's funny because as we talk about in the jolt effect is this is kind of shifting your mindset from being a salesperson. And I think what sales has been, what the definition of sales has been for a really long time is the art of overcoming the customer status quo, right? The art and science maybe, right? But the customer we know is mired in their status quo. They believe what they're doing today is good enough. They believe what you're talking about is not a compelling enough alternative. They believe that solving this problem is not a big enough priority. So it's all about defeating that status quo, demonstrating the value and getting them to move forward. And I think what we realized with this book is that, yes, that is a big part of being a successful salesperson, but sales is actually more than that. Sales isn't just about being a great salesperson. It's also about being a great buyer's agent, right? That's less about defeating their status quo, but also instilling the confidence that they're making a great decision, that they're working with somebody who has their best interests in mind, and that you've got their back. They're going to look like a hero, not like a fool. And so I think it's that dynamic a little bit when you think about being great at sales or what is sales, it is about defeating that status quo bias. It's also about, as we'll talk about, defeating the omission bias, right? Which is that fear of failure that leads a lot of customers to, to not buy and then leads you know you to miss your numbers. I've seen sales and I've, I've worked hard to define to get my definition right. I've really worked over the years to, to do this and because I wanted to stay in sales. I liked it, right? Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do it unless I knew what I was doing. And 
a lot of what you're saying really resonates because it, I've I've defined it as leadership, service, and wayfinding. And and yeah. leadership is such that there's such a component of leadership to helping somebody achieve a vision that's that's right for them and overcoming that that decision. And then I look at services, the the side where you know I am going to help you. The status quo, you need to move forward. <laughs> gotta, yeah. I got to yeah. get you something that you need. So I, I just resonated with it at, at so many levels. And this idea of, and the jolt effect is has, has a big, big component of this where we're talking about this move from selling as the status quo to mm-hmm. selling as overcoming the status quo to selling as really helping overcome indecision, mm-hmm. right? That's right. And so how did that come about? Like, tell me a little bit about what that means to you and how that came about. Yeah, so we I'll, maybe I'll take a step back for the listeners. Um, this was a new one for us. I, I, some of the listeners may be familiar with uh, Challenger Sale mm-hmm. and some of the work we did there. And we've always taken a research based approach to studying sales. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of work out there, a lot of great work from people who've been salespeople, right? Who have led sales teams and they're sharing their secrets of success and the the techniques that have led to their success. That's not our approach. I'm not a salesperson. I'm a researcher. And I think in some ways that kind of uh, distinguishes our approach a little bit. But our goal is to document what best salespeople have already figured out on their own, right? And then kind of then tell their story with, with data and with the qualitative and quantitative data. We saw a unique opportunity. If you go back and rewind the clock to March of 2020, we saw kind of a unique opportunity, which hopefully is a once in a lifetime opportunity, which is that to study sales in a completely amen. new way. Remember, yeah. Right. Remember March of 2020. <laughs> yeah. Amen. This, yeah. This is the, right. So we think of that time very fondly, right? Uh, Tiger King, uh, sourdough bread, like, mm-hmm. you know, fighting for toilet paper in the grocery store, all these great things that happened. One of the interesting things that happened in B2B sales was sales flipped to hundred percent virtual literally overnight. I mean, we all remember this zoom. Of course we were using virtual platforms for some of our sales interactions. It went to hundred percent, the mundane interactions, the really critical negotiations, consensus building calls, you know, those kinds of conversations were all happening virtually. So we said, boy, this is our opportunity to study sales in a completely different way. So we recruited several dozen companies into a project where we asked them, would you basically give us your sales calls for the next 12, 18 months? And, and they did. And so we collected two and a half million recorded sales calls. We transcribed those into text and uh, using a transcription engine. Then we use a machine learning platform to study them. Now, what we were studying specifically was uh, two things, because you could ask that, you could ask a big data set, lots of questions, but the questions mm-hmm. we were really obsessed with at the time were what leads a customer to uh, make no decision, right? What is it that leads to that wasteland outcome that I think we're so familiar with in in sales, which is all the time and energy we pour into pursuing an opportunity. And frustratingly, often those customers say they want to move forward with us. They say the status quo is unacceptable. And then they ghost us. They just kind of disengage. They go radio silent. I jokingly tell people, it reminds me of my dating life in college where the relationship is over. It just takes you like another couple months to figure it out, right? <laughs> this is like the bane of every salesperson's existence. So it's always been this problem in sales and we've never had a good answer for it. I think the more important second question is, what do the best salespeople do differently to avoid that? So what we found was a pretty interesting. There's this moment in... Um, first of all, I, I would say we found that anywhere between 40 and 60% of the average salesperson's qualified pipeline is going to be lost to no decision. And that is painful. That is especially painful if you're a leader of a revenue organization and think about that multiplied across your sales force. I mean, there's so much conversation about prospecting and lead gen and above the funnel and generating that demand and more opportunities. What I'm telling sales leaders right now is actually the answer to higher productivity is in your pipeline right now. And it's avoiding that wasteland of no decision. Now, what we found was there's this interesting moment. If we think about sales in a simple three-act play, we got our customer in their status quo. We got to get them to agree on a new way forward, a new uh, a new vision of moving forward with us as a provider, and then we got to get them to sign on the dotted line or execute the DocuSign. There's this moment where things uh, go sideways a, a high percentage of the time. It's between the point where the customer says they're bought in and before they actually buy it, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Between I want this and I bought this, intent and action. It's between that second and third step. Challenger was actually a story more about. How do you go from the status quo to getting the customer to just agree that the status quo is suboptimal and what you are talking about is going to be much better for my organization and for me and my team and so on and so forth? The journey, though, is often often gets derailed between where they're, they say they're bought in and before they actually execute the DocuSign. And what we find is that salespeople have grown up in a world believing, because we've told them this, 
The only reason a deal goes south after the customer has stated their intent to move forward is they are still in the vice grip of the status quo. Either they don't believe they believe what they're doing today is good enough, they don't believe your solution is a compelling enough alternative, or they don't think it's a top priority. And so what we told salespeople to do is go back and dial up the FOMO, the fear of missing out. And the way this happens in sales conversations, two and a half million sales conversations, there are three techniques we found. The first one is reconvince the customer of the value of your solution. You know, mm-hmm. Paul, you must have missed how many zeros were on that ROI projection, or you must have missed this case. Let me get you back in the demo environment, show you this again, because everyone else thinks this is super cool. You must have blinked when we showed you this last time. Let me show you again. How could you pass up on this? It's clearly better than what you're doing today. The second technique is a little darker. This is the FUD tactic, right? Still in this this bucket of FOMO techniques, but dialing up the FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So I'm trying to create a burning platform that you have no choice but to abandon and say like, Paul, you know, these problems aren't going to solve themselves. You know, we work with all your big competitors and they're making tremendous headway and you guys are going to be left with this terrible, crappy status quo you were complaining about, you know, last month when we first started this process. When those, uh, we're trying to get the customer to realize the cost of their inaction, right? When those techniques fail, the third technique is almost always the 10% discount that's only good this quarter, right? And the price yep. goes up next quarter. You, you got to buy it now yep. or nothing I can do, right? Yep. There are different variants of that in product based companies. You see like supply chain shortages and inventory shortages often thrown around. In software based businesses, you often, in technology, you hear about implementation windows. If you don't sign today, I can't get you in queue. You're going to have to wait six months for us to install it, all that stuff. It's all FOMO, right? We're trying to re- get the customer to realize the cost of their inaction. Now, what we'll, what wasn't surprising to us is that uh, most salespeople go back and, and run that playbook because they've been taught the status quo is your biggest, if not only, competitor in sales. But what we were surprised to learn is that that playbook actually backfires way more often than it works out, especially with those customers who've stated that the status quo stinks and I'm ready to move forward with you. And then they get cold feet. Using that playbook actually has a much higher probability of making things worse, not better. You you actually increase the odds that deal will be lost to no decision. And here's why. When we dug into the data, we found that no decision losses are actually a function of two things, not one. We only We only ever were aware of the status quo preference that the customer has. They don't believe what you're talking about is is a more compelling alternative. They think the what they're doing today is good enough, or they don't think it's a top priority. Those are all f- things that FOMO is designed to solve for, right? Uh, Challenger is about overcoming that bias. But it turns out there's a second reason deals are lost to no decision, which also is the bigger of the two reasons. And it is not the preference for the status quo, it's the customer's fear of failure and the indecision that that, re, uh, that, that is uh, brought upon the customer because they are scared of failing. They're scared of making the decision what might happen. Now, this is because of something that I think you're familiar with as a social scientist, which is called the omission bias. Again, we are all aware of the status quo bias. People are lazy. They don't like to change. We've got to break that gravitational pull of the status quo. But the omission bias, it turns out, is a bigger reason that customers do nothing. The omission bias is rooted in the customer's fear of messing up. It's not their fear of missing out. It's their fear of messing up. It's something called an error of commission. Error of omission is where the customer realizes a loss by doing nothing. They sit on the sideline and they experience a loss. An error of commission is where they do something and that something leads to a loss. So that loss is directly attributable to a decision you made or an action you took. And it turns out in the human mind, people care a lot more about errors of commission, being personally responsible for the loss, than sitting by the sidelines and watching a loss just happen, right? But not being personally culpable. That's an error of omission. That's what's known as the omission bias. We are biased towards choosing things that avoid personal responsibility and culpability, What I tell the shorthand for this is for salespeople, the FOMO, fear of missing out, matters a lot less than the FOMU. The FOMU is the fear of messing up. Yeah. In your customer's mind, it is fear of failure that keeps them from moving forward. Now, just to kind of close the loop here, this is why when we go back and we run the data, that running that FOMO playbook with a customer who's convinced the status quo stinks, they're convinced that what you're talking about is a way better path forward Going back and dangling a 10% discount in front of somebody who's actually not worried about that, what they're worried about is losing their job for for putting their name on a decision or investment that doesn't pan out. That is what they're really worried about. And so in the book, we we talk about what are the things that people worry about and how do you deal with that? And that's the Joel playbook, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more detail. One of the things that's interesting to me in this, and hopefully our listeners would, would find this interesting as well, but 2020... Through 2023, right, has has been a really unique time yeah. in this whole idea of fear of messing up. 
right? You're isolated. So generally now, and I was a buyer at that time, actually. Mm -hmm. So I was isolated, uncertain of what's going to happen in the next two to three years. That uncertainty Mm -hmm. is as raised and you are, you're highlighted because you are not even around a group of people. Zoom yeah. is not. I sorry, Zoom. I love you. We're, we're recorded, but it's not a group of people. You are yeah. you are alone looking at a screen. How do you think that that impacts this this type of data? Is there? Do you think there's been a rise in that fear messing up, or is this? Have you seen it just be a part of the natural condition of? Yeah. Us? So this is such a uh, an interesting question. I think. So I think it, the answer is yes, but to yes, yes, both our uh, hypotheses are right. So on the one hand. I do think that I can't remember what it's called, but you know this the telescope they shot out like a million miles past the moon and it's returning these amazing images of the galaxy, right? We've never seen it before. That's the only it was always there. It's been there for billions of years. We just never had the technology to find it. And I think in many respects, indecision is like that. That in a world of like just passed down wisdom from leader to manager to rep, and where you're you've grown up believing that, you know status quo is your only enemy, then you never look for anything else. It wasn't until we took two and a half million sales calls and used machine learning to find out, actually, there's more to it than that. So I think now we have the technology, but I also think it's getting worse. So that's why I say it's it's yes to both. If you look at the things that cause people to be indecisive, it's things like choice overload, too many options. What vendor out there is not putting more options in front of his customers? We got basic versions, premium versions, platinum versions. We've got professional services. We've got DIY. We've got partner integrations. We've got a whole ecosystem of partners. I got roadmap items. I got contract links. I got different ways of enterprise wide, use case specific, you name it, whatever you want. Like I'm a bobblehead. You just say, you ask for something, and I say yes. In a, yes. In a world, yes. in a world yes. where, every, yeah, in a world where everything looks good, the best choice for the customer is to choose none of them because they're afraid of picking the wrong one. So choice overload exacerbates indecision. The second one is information overload. So, you know, think about it. In any any of the listeners out there, I, I would argue, I don't know what your industry is, but I guarantee you there's more information about you and your competitors and your space and your technology today than there was yesterday. And guess what? Next year, there's going to be orders of magnitude more than there is today. That creates a situation in which it is impossible for customers to consume it all. But they want to, right? Because they believe that your job as a salesperson is to put one over on them and hide the dirty laundry. And so it's their job to level the playing field by doing lots of research. But how do you do that in a world where you can't consume it all? This source of indecision is specifically rooted in the customer's fear that some new piece of information will be revealed after the contract is signed. That maybe your platform doesn't integrate in the way they thought. Maybe there was a better option out there. Maybe a competitor is better suited Whose job was it to do? Oh, it was your job to do all the research, your job to leave no stone unturned, and you didn't. You took the salesperson's word for it. Now you've got egg on your face or maybe even get fired for that lack of due diligence. The third source of indecision, um, and by the way, again, as I said before, information is, ex- the amount of content is exploding. Suppliers are contributing it to it. Third-party analysts like Gartner and Forrester and everyone else, LinkedIn content, you name it. There's just a, an ocean of information out there. The last source of indecision is called outcome uncertainty. This is where the customer worries about not getting the returns that you're promising. I think this one is also getting worse because most companies in B2B are moving from, how do I sell a simple product on a transactional basis to a solution that is stickier, it's more embedded in the customer organization, it's a longer contract length, it's rolled out enterprise-wide, it's got more integrations, it becomes really hard to rip at that out and replace it. That's great business for the supplier. But for the customer, it exacerbates their fear about like, are we actually get this is a lot of money? This is going to cause a lot, require a lot of resources and commitment. Are we really going to get the benefits this vendor is projecting? It's easy to to agree to a simple product purchase. If it doesn't work out, big deal. You didn't spend a lot to learn that lesson. But a transfer, like we're all selling transformation. Transformation sounds really cool, but it really makes people sweat whether they're going to get those transformative benefits. And so I think all three of those things, choice overload, information overload, outcome uncertainty are getting worse. I think the economy that we're in right now is causing a spike in no decision. I'm hearing this all the time. There was a sales leader I spoke to back at uh, Dreamforce in October when we launched the book. I remember talking to this executive and he said, "Yeah, I don't think no decision loss is a big deal for us. That person called me last week and said, hey, can you present that jolt effect research to my team? Because this is we went into the data and this is our number one enemy is no mm-hmm. decision. Like We had no idea and it's getting worse every day. In some ways, I think the economy is almost a red herring because we're seeing a momentary uptick 
but I think this problem is going to get worse long after the economy gets better. Yeah, I, I agree with. I mean, just experientially, right? I don't mm-hmm. have the data to pack uh, to pack into it, but experientially, I absolutely agree. I mean, simply because I mean, remote work is not going going away, right? So mm-hmm. you don't have a tribe to make decisions with. Yeah, you have uh, much, much, much broader range of information. It is hard to be confident, and I mean, so. It's hard to be confident in making a decision to change massively. It's not hard to be confident in making a small change, but but sure. generally you made that confidence change based on the fact that you you thought you'd done all the research, you'd done yeah. everything, you emotionally yeah. like them as well, right? And so you're assuaging that uh, emotional indecision. So what is jolt? So tell me a little yeah, bit. Sure, We're, we we outlined the main the one and two is uh, status quo. And yep. indecision. Yep. What is what is Jolt? Yeah. So Jolt is actually an acronym. So it stands for the four behaviors that were revealed through the analysis, um, the playbook that high performers are using to overcome indecision. So four behaviors. The first one is judging the level of indecision. Look, it, it all starts there. An indecision is this funny thing where people don't like talking about fear of failure. It turns out. And by the way, if you ask your customer, do you consider yourself a decisive executive? One hundred percent of them will say yes. The data tells a very different story. We found that in two and a half million sales calls, 87% of customers were demonstrating either moderate or high levels of indecision. So the people who are unencumbered by fear of failure, if you find some of those people, you should sell as much as humanly possible to them every day of the week and twice on Sunday. There just aren't a lot of them out there. And this is true even of senior executives. So how do we make it such that we can get the customer comfortable to talk about these issues, these these sources of, of indecision, these fears of failure, get them on the table so we can... Uh, game plan, uh, how are we going to overcome them? We can forecast off the level of indecision, and then we can make the tough decision in certain situations to disqualify opportunities if they're too far gone, right? There's no hope of getting this customer off the fence. Our time is better spent elsewhere. So that's J, judging the level of indecision. The O is offering your recommendation. So remember, we talked about choice overload. This is about how do we cut through the burden of choice and guide our customers to make a great decision. That's about shifting from asking needs diagnosis actually to telling how do we chalk the field and make a recommendation to instill the confidence and when we do that we harness um, what's called the delegation effect which is the burden of a bad choice shifts from the decider toward the recommender and great salespeople understand this and they're ready to shoulder that that risk with the customer to say i am telling you this is the right path to go forward paul customers like you get a tremendous amount of value out of this by the way you don't need this other stuff you're going to be really happy with this configuration. The L is about limiting the expiration. So in a world where customers want to be an expert, how do we get them to stop trying to be an expert and start trusting you as an expert? The keys to getting that right are, are twofold. Well, it's first important to recognize that they don't see you as a trusted expert because they don't trust you and they don't think you're an expert. So we've got to solve for those two things. We've got to instill, we've got to build a bank of goodwill and trust with our customer. We say that a lot in sales. What we found were the actual moments and the things that are said by top salespeople to build up that goodwill and show the customer, I'm not here to oversell you. I'm here to get you to a great decision. That is my only priority in this process. We build up that bank of goodwill. We also use moments to demonstrate our expertise. We are not glorified MCs on these calls. We are subject matter experts. Yes, I bring in product people. I bring in engineers. I bring in executive sponsors uh, who can go deep on certain elements of our product and our service. But I also know what I'm talking about. And I am a person that you can see as an expert who can guide you to a great decision. In that scenario, that earns you the right to say no to the fifth reference call or the third demo or the another, you know, another proof of concept trial in another part of the business, which we all know is going to prove the same thing as the first proof of concept trial. So it earns us the right to use a little bit of radical candor and say, that's not a great spend of your time. Let me be a better steward of your time and resources. Let's figure out what's really going on here. Let me get you the information you're looking for. It's not reading another white paper. It's not another reference call. It's not a Gartner Magic Quadrant report. The Mm -hmm. T is taking risk off the table. So this is a combination of setting proper expectations up front, the old under-promise and over-deliver adage, but it's also a function of creating a safety net for our customers so they don't feel like they're jumping off a cliff without a safety net, but you're there to catch them. You've got their back and they have an assurance that they're going to look like a hero, not like a fool, because you are road mapping the path from signature to value in such a way that they feel confident that, again... If anything, we're going to overperform here. The chances that this is going to go sideways are really, really low and have been greatly reduced. I feel like I'm not jumping out of plane by myself. I'm with a tandem skydiving instructor strapped to my back, ready to make sure everything goes great. So that's what we're trying to do with the Jolt Effect. It's 
Again, we like it because it's memorable, but it also speaks to what's happening. It's about jolting our customer out of their stuck, indecisive state, right? They're mired in their own fear of failure, and we got to jolt them into action from, I want this, to I actually bought this, from intent uh, to action. I'm going to go all the way back to your sure. initial definition of sales, right? Mm-hmm. And when you're telling me about that, a longtime person uh, essentially that said, you know, I've, the less I try, the more I do this, right? <laughs> the better I am at it. Because it's not about the perfect, necessarily the perfect words. It's not about necessarily the perfect phrase. This is about truly, I'm listening to you and I'm hearing, this is about walking through with your customer the same way that you would walk through with, heck, your child about indecision, Uh, about, hey, let's, yeah, yeah, let's, I I care about you. I'm a trusted resource. I'm not going to make the choice for you, but, but doggone it, I'm going to have an opinion on it and I'm going to recommend something that actually I truly believe in. Yeah. And so how have you found that when you go out and train people and discuss this? Because there there is a belief factor like for salespeople. Like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna put my neck out on the line and do that, that's a huge belief factor in the fact that we absolutely can deliver. And I've found good salespeople, actually great salespeople, they change the whole culture of an organization because they're so yeah. darn adamant about that is gonna happen. I put my neck out for this customer. We are going to do yes. it. Yeah. So, what type of feedback are you getting when you're teaching this from people? Yeah, you're you're 100 right. So I think there's this playbook. I think runs the gamut from like could have had a V8 moments of like, oh, I should just do this differently on tomorrow's call, uh, tomorrow morning's call, all the way to this is stuff that I've got to work harder with my organization. It's going to take a longer time to do this, or even skills that are going to take me a longer time to develop. Because people ask me a lot, like, what do I do first? What's the stuff that's going to take a little bit longer to develop? Some of what you're you're talking about. And I I think one of the most important things is that salespeople understand that their enemy is not just the status quo. And every every indecisive customer doesn't need to be hit with your FOMO hammer. That in fact, a lot of more often than not, it's not that you failed to convince them of the value, it's that they're worried about looking bad or they're worried about losing their job, especially in this environment. And so at least understanding it, the number one thing I hear back from salespeople is now they've read the book or they've heard this, they see it everywhere. Like, uh, I, I thought what they were saying was this, now I'm hearing it totally differently. I actually think they're struggling with this, but I had happy years on before because I didn't think that was, you know, it was an issue. But now that I know what to listen for, what to look for, how to surface these concerns. So, you know, I think one is you're, you're going to see it easy, right? Be aware of it and you see, you'll start to see it everywhere. Two is pump the brakes before you go and hammer the customer with that status, beat the status quo playbook and understand that you run a high probability of actually making it worse. The reason is that FOMO playbook, you're basically using scare tactics to sell to somebody who's already afraid, but they're not afraid of what you think they're afraid of. They're not afraid of missing out. They're afraid of messing up. And once you understand that, you're going to be more sensitive to it. And you're going to think twice. You're going to dig a little bit deeper and maybe holster that you know that that FOMO cannon for a, for a bit and, and wait, right? Now, there's other stuff that's going to take a while. I, I find as you move through this, offering a recommendation, I think what's interesting about this is even less tenured salespeople, as long as, they, as they've been selling for some length of time, and it doesn't have to be a lot, it could be a month, it could be a quarter, it could be you know, less, certainly less than a year, and you ask them, what is the best configuration that your customer should buy? Like, what, do you, what would you recommend? If it was your friend buying this from you, what would you tell them to buy? And by the way, what would you tell them not to buy? Even stuff that you make, right? Would you tell people to buy the premium version? Or are you just trying to do it because it's a better commission check for you? Would you tell them that that partner integration that we, by the way, we all know doesn't really work? Would you tell them that? Would you actually tell them that your competitor is better than you are in certain areas? In some ways, it takes. it's funny because every salesperson knows this stuff, but they tend to keep this stuff to themselves because they don't want to they certainly don't want to unsell the customer, especially if the customer is talking themselves into something bigger, right? Why would you ever do that? And they they don't want to admit that they're not good at everything, right? And so that's and it comes across as almost it's not credible from the customer standpoint when every every question they ask you, the answer is yes, we can do that. Yes, we're the best in the market at that. That can't actually be true. And so that level of candor, being honest with them. It earns you the right to guide them to a choice. It builds up that trust bank, right? It overcomes what's called the agency dilemma, which is the problem. The customer comes to the table, not because of anything you did, but because of them being burned in the past by all those other salespeople who overpromised, underdelivered, and put one over on them. They sold them more than they needed. They come into that dynamic believing it's a pitched battle. You're trying to sell to them. 
and they're trying to fig- cut through the noise and figure out what really is the right answer for our business. And you can help cut through that noise by being honest, guiding them to what to buy, what not to buy, telling them what information is bunk and what they should actually spend their time, even information that's not just from you, maybe it's from your competitors, or information doesn't cast you in the best light. But I really think you should listen to that podcast. You should read that Gardner Magic Quadrant Report. Those are pieces of guidance that, again, put you on the customer side of the table as a buyer's agent more than just a salesperson. And you know some, some of these other things, think about taking risk off the table. Some of those things are, are things that are going to take longer uh, for the customer. You mentioned like, hey, if I'm going to put my neck on the line and, and put my name against this thing I'm selling the customer, I need the organization to be able to deliver against that. Can we document that? Can we show them the roadmap from signature to value? Are we ready to resource that so that I can say, there is no chance this is going to go sideways. There is a high chance it's going to go better than expected. There is no chance it's going to go worse than expected. And I can stand by that because I'm going to look really bad and I'm going to lose that customer and, cert- and maybe lose credibility in the marketplace if we can't stand by that. Some of that stuff takes a little bit longer to develop. It requires leadership. It requires organizational alignment. It requires finance and sales leadership permissioning that certain de-risking options be put on the table for the customer. So again, there's stuff we can do right away. And then there's stuff that's going to take a little bit longer for us to build up as an organization and as sellers. There's a fascinating trend that I've been, again, I haven't measured it, but I've been observing, which is, and you're talking right at it, which is this idea that selling is actually becoming, I hate to use the the phrase more human, but it is becoming more human centered and we need it in this time rather than more product centered or pitch centered or anything. It's, you said something very interesting there about being the trusted expert, right? I had a once a mentor that said to me, you know, what do you need to build trust? Well, the first thing you need to do is be trustworthy, right? Exactly. So yeah. Everything that you're talking about here is is directly in line with the fact that there has been a lot of crap. <laughs> and we can agree, like over the years, as you, you talked about, it's it's like there's been a lot of stuff that has gotten in the way of really selling person to person. Mm-hmm. And what I, what I love about this is you're ripping that off the table, right? Judging the level of indecision is a decidedly human element, That's right? right? It's it's That's right. it's a decidedly human skill where you need actually need cognitive empathy to look at somebody and say, "Yeah, guess what? <laughs> you know, they're yeah. they're reacting as another person reacts instead of they're reacting as a prospect reacts." Uh, that's really well said. I I think beating the status quo is a uh, an exercise that is. There are emotional techniques used, but I think objections are largely rooted in rational objections. I don't see the value. I think what we're doing today is good enough. This is not a priority for us. There's not enough daylight between what you're pitching to us and what we already do today. Those are largely, they come across as rational objections. Indecision comes across as largely emotional uh, fears, right? And, And it's funny because you look at the level of emotion in deals lost because of the FOMU, because of the fear of failure. And these calls are just loaded with buyer emotion, right? It's not ra- it's not rooted in the rational. They should say, yes, the ROI is there. That's clearly better than what they do say. It's definitely a priority. All their competitors are kicking their butts in the market. How could they say no? Well, they couldn't, but emotionally they will because they're worried about things going south on them and going sideways and looking bad or losing their jobs. I think you're hitting on something that's really important, which is this idea that you can throw... ROI calculators and proof points and success stories and reference customers and content at the customer until the cows come home. That will not solve for that human dynamic. And by the way, this is not just about the million dollar purchase. This is the same thing that keeps myself and my family from picking a movie on movie night because, and all we do is watch previews because we think it's the next preview watch is going to be the movie we should really spend $4 on, right? Or it's the same reason that it took me almost a year to buy a new mattress because there's so many damn like makers and there's so many reviews and there's so much information. And and I know they have a 365 day sleep (laughs) review, uh, sleep test. I'm not going to send the damn thing back. Like, you know what? And by the way, you know who gets blamed for the bad choice? And like when my wife's back is hurting her in the morning and she's like, that was Mm -hmm. a bad sleep night of sleep was horrible. It's me. Like, it's the same thing. These are human phenomena we're talking about. And so I like what you're saying here is that this is about bringing the human dimension. And I think what's so interesting is in this current chat GPT age that we live in, you know, look, there are things that machines are really good at. This is not one of them, at least not yet, right? And mm-hmm. so it elevates our role as the seller. If anything, 
This is a resounding call for a human-centric approach to sales. And that is what defines the best sellers, is that they are not just selling to the customer. In some ways, they're buying for them. They're a buyer's agent. They, they see it as their job to get the customer to a great decision. And they calculate, yeah, I'm sure they like Lucite trophies and trips to Cabo. That, who doesn't, right? But that's not the scoreboard for them. The scoreboard is how many customers are calling me back saying, thank you for what we thank you for getting me here and thank you for the returns we're seeing and the value you're delivering that's what gets them out of bed in the morning well i can't thank you enough matt this has been this has been absolutely awesome i i truly appreciate it one of the things i i definitely want you to be able to share is how do people like besides buying the book on amazon sure. right how, how do people interact with you how do people work with you in terms of if they really want to invest and learn more Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, one easy thing, and, and I encourage everybody to anybody who heard me on the show, if you want to be engaged, uh, send me a note on LinkedIn and let's get connected that way. Maybe you have a follow up question. Love to be connected with you and, uh, and answer any questions I can. Obviously, uh, check out the book. And then uh, if you want to learn more about Jolt Effect, uh, go to jolteffect.com. So there's a lot more about the research. There's some free tools, coaching tools, other uh, decision guides that you can download there. And then a lot of options we're offering to bring some of these skills to your Salesforce if that's uh, of interest to, to you and to your team. Awesome. Well, I can't, I can't, uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend the book. Thank you. And I can't thank you enough for for being on. And uh, with that, everybody, we're signing off. Have an awesome, awesome day.